Okay, good morning. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, tree-based classifiers, tree models, and uh, model ensembles. These are not strictly related topics, so you can use model ensembles on any kind of model. Uh, but in practice, they are often used with trees, so this is a kind of a natural grouping. Specifically, one of the most popular models for doing data science, for doing machine learning on, uh, in a classical setting, so the setting where you have a big table with instances on the rows and features on the columns. In that setting, one of the most popular uh, algorithms that seems to work the best out of the box on the most settings is the uh, gradient-boosted decision trees. So a combination of the uh, decision tree classifier with gradient boosting ensembling method. Um, so that will be our through line for today. We'll talk about lots of different things, but uh, basically this is a very good out-of-the-box method if you're doing classical machine learning. So essentially if you want to win a Kaggle competition, this is usually the place to start. So step one obviously then is to talk about decision trees. Uh, we've seen them, them already, I introduced them in the first, um, first lecture, if you remember, but um, I didn't tell you how to train them. I said we'll talk about that later, so that time has now come. Uh, and then we'll talk about regression trees, which is the same thing, but for regression, so predicting numeric uh, target values. And the break. And we'll start talking about ensembling methods, which is basically the idea of instead of training one model, training a bunch of models and asking all of them what the uh, target label should be and somehow combining all their judgments into one in hopes of getting uh, uh, a better result than any model individually would give you. The simplest approach is bagging. We'll look at first. Then, look at a slightly more complicated approach, boosting, of which there are two uh, famous uh, ways of doing that, ADA boost and gradient boosting. We'll look at both of them in detail. And then we'll finish up with stacking, which is not that complicated and is quite uh, useful in, for instance, neural network settings. Uh, so that's the plan for today. And for the first half, so this uh, decision trees, regression trees, we will use this data set as a running example, which is always opposite this time of year. So we're predicting for movies whether or not they will win an Oscar. So we have three classification categories. Did they win? Were they nominated? Or were they overlooked? And uh, for once in this lecture series, we will start with categorical features, because that's where decision trees uh, fit most naturally. We'll look later at how to translate this to numeric features, but for now all the features are categorical. So we have a rating, which is sort of which age group the movie is uh, suitable for, which can be PG, G, or R. We have a genre, three genres, science fiction, drama, or romance. And then we have uh, the aspect ratio, the size of the screen basically, which looks like a number, but it's basically just two possible values, the green one and the purple one. So we have three uh, categorical values, and based on that, we want to predict whether or not the movie is going to win an Oscar. That's our uh, running example. So we've seen decision trees already, but this is what they look like in this example. So this is just a how a particular decision tree might look. Could be a good model, could be a terrible model, just to illustrate what one single model looks like. So we start at the root, the bit at the top. We pick one feature to split on, as we call it. Uh, in this case, genre. So we uh, look at whether the movie is genre. Depending on that, we go to the left, the middle, or the right. Um, and then if we go to the left, we look at what, what the rating of the movie is, and so on. So, uh, And then uh, at some point, we end up at the leaves, the parts of the tree that have nothing below it, uh, which are these guys. And we label the leaves with an output class. So his, this is a complete decision tree. So we look at a, an example, we follow it all the way down to the leaves, then we get a class, and that's the class that we predict for that example. So if we get an example like this, 
a movie with the uh, rating G, the genre drama, and aspect ratio 239. We want to know what class it has. Well, this particular model, we start at the root. Uh, we split first on the genre, which is drama. We follow the tree down to the aspect ratio. Tree tells us to look at the aspect ratio, which is 239, which brings us to a leaf, and that leaf tells us that we predict that this will win an Oscar. So it's not a very deep model, because it only looks at the genre and the aspect ratio. Um, but that's the basic principle which, as I said, we've seen already, uh, but we haven't seen how to train these trees, how to, given the data set, how to find the model. Is it, uh, so that's what we'll look at today. And the standard algorithm is often called ID3 or C, uh, for the file, oh, sorry, we have a question. Uh, so the question is, why don't we look at the rating for the drama movies? Um, we might. That might be a better model. So this is a completely arbitrary model. This might be a terrible model. Just to uh, illustrate the principle of how, given a model, we find the classification. Now we see what makes a good model. So the uh, standard algorithm is uh, often called ID3 or C45. C45 is a successor to ID3. Practically, they do basically the same thing. Uh, so for your purposes, you can just call them by either name. Um, the basic idea is to start with an empty tree and to extend it step by step. So we start with a, we choose a split, a feature to split on for the root, which gives us three leaves. And then for each leaf, we can choose another feature to split at. And we keep going and going and going until we think it's enough, we'll look at stop conditions later. Uh, so we extend it step by step like this. Important is that it's greedy. For now, there's no backtracking. So once we've split on a feature, once we've extended the tree, it stays extended. We can only uh, make the tree bigger and bigger, but not smaller. And we look for the split. This is the important part. We look for the split that creates the least uniform distribution. So the split that creates the biggest uh, uh, separation in the class distribution among the uh, instances that hit that part of the tree. So look at that in detail, what that means. So we'll start at the, uh, we'll start at, start at the beginning. So we have a, a complete data set, and we need a, to choose a feature for the root node. We need to pick our first feature to split on here, top left. So this is the class distribution over the whole data set, 23, 12, 11. Uh, that's how over the whole data set these classes are distributed. So going in, that's our class distribution. And we have, we'll just look at two features for now. We'll uh, look at either the rating feature, which we can split on, or the genre feature. Uh, so if we were to split on rating, it would look like this. So here we see the whole data set split into three rows in this case. So all these uh, instances at the top, all these instances in the middle, and all these instances in the bottom are put together which gives us these three class distributions, 743, 934, and 754. So despite, uh, except for the fact that the numbers of obviously have gotten lower, the proportions are roughly the same as they were before the split, right? So we have a big class, the red class overlooked its biggest, and then the orange and blue classes one and nominated are roughly the same. So basically, if you compare the situation before the split and after the split, independent of which uh, leaf we end up in, uh, we don't really know anything more. We don't really have a, a better idea of what class we should give this, uh, this example after we've uh, taken one step in this tree, which means that this is a bad split. It doesn't tell us anything. It doesn't give us any information. So let's look at the other one then. Genre. We get a different split. So now we split the uh, data set uh, vertically into chunks. And what we see now is that if we split on science fiction, for instance, on the we split on genre and we go to the science fiction, uh, we 
we observe a science fiction movie, we see that in our whole data set, no science fiction movie has ever won an Oscar, if we go for the best picture Oscar. Um, so what we know now, what we see is that the uh, distribution has changed a lot, and we know a lot more about what class we should assign after we've split on this feature. Uh, and the other ones, it's less clear, but it's also, we see that drama has suddenly has a, a much higher chance of winning than the other two. Uh, so drama also gives us much more information. So this overall is a much better split than genre, because afterwards the uh, uh, class distributions are much less uniform than they were going in. And then, so we pick genre, let's say. And then after genre, we, pick, we can split again, in this case, based on rating. Uh, and if we do that, then we see that this is the, for this tree here on the left, this on the right is the way the data set is divided into five chunks, which we call segments, five parts of the instance space, partitions, uh, a partition of five chunks of the instance space, big one on the left, big one on the right, and three little ones in the middle. And these we call the segments. Segments of the instance space. Uh, so that's the basic principle. We'll look at how to define this precisely later, but two notes before we continue that are important uh, for your understanding. The first is that we choose a separate split for every node that we extend. So it's not that we split at the same level in the same order every time. It may well be that if we split on genre, then rating is the best next split. But if we split on genre and encounter a drama film, then we should split on aspect ratio the next time. So for every leaf node we encounter, we choose a different one to split on. Yes. So we split here on R, Y, uh, only in the middle column. That's precisely because of this. So what we see is uh, the first split is on genre. If the genre is drama, then the second split is R. So if the genre here at the top is drama, then we split that column by rating. But it may well be that if the genre is uh, R, romance, then we split the second feature on aspect ratio which is sort of a third dimension that I didn't draw here. Uh, so it depends on what your first choice is, what your second choice is. As you can see here, uh, yeah, the, if we split the first one by genre, the second one might be split by rating, for instance. Um, second note, second thing to note, is that it doesn't make much sense to split on something you've already split on. So here we see a tree with a genre, and then below that genre split, there's another genre split. Everything that comes into this third node, this bottom node here, genre, we already know it must have the genre um, yellow, uh, romance, I think. So that split doesn't tell us anything, because anything that ends up hitting this second genre node will go into the, uh, the left uh, leaf. Uh, so if you have categorical features, it doesn't make sense to split twice on the same feature. It's a different story for numerical features, but we'll look at that later. So just two notes to keep in mind. Um, when do we stop? When do we stop adding notes, splitting notes? Uh, there's usually three stop conditions. First, it's often helpful to set a maximum depth. So you just want some maximum depth has been hit, you stop, you look at the segment that you have there, uh, which then in that case may contain multiple examples, and then you output the majority class usually, that's usually the most straightforward thing to do. Uh, if you're not at the maximum depth yet, but all feature values in your segment are all the same, so in our case all movies have the same genre, rating, and aspect ratio, and then there's no more features left to divide them up. In that case, you can also stop, because no feature is going to split that set, so no feature will give you any more information. Um, in that case, you also output the majority class among your segment. Uh, 
And it can also happen that within your segment, all values, all instances have the same class value. And then you output that one. Because no matter how you split after that, the majority class is always going to stay the same. Uh, so you just output the whatever class is left over. And if you follow these three subconditions, you know that after splitting for a number of times, you end up with a, uh, with a tree that you can use. Uh, so now all we have to do is to make precise what we mean by this uniformity. How exactly we compute this value that will tell us which of all the current candidates to split on is the best candidate. Yes? Uh, so the, max, uh, the question is, what is the maximum depth precisely? Uh, it's the distance from the root to the uh, leaf. In, well, steps. It doesn't really matter, but usually in steps. So in this case, this is a tree of uh, this is a tree of depth three, basically. Uh, yeah. So how do we compute this value that will rank our candidates for the best split? Uh, for that, we need to make precise what we mean by the uniformity of a probability distribution. So these classes, this distribution of classes, we can interpret that as a probability distribution. We can ask how uniform is a probability distribution, which is easy to do. If you have two classes, then a uniform distribution is 50-50, and the further away you get from 50-50, the less uniform it is. So that one's easy. But if you have three classes, things get a little bit more tricky. For instance, here we see three, uh, two distributions on three classes. And what we see is that in the top one, uh, the red class is quite overrepresented. So clearly, this is non-uniform because of that. In the bottom one, the red class is less overrepresented. But then in the remainder, the orange class is more overrepresented. So we have a really... Uh, tiny proportion of blues in this class. So it's very difficult to say intuitively which of these two distributions is further away from a perfect 30, uh, 33, 33, 33 split. So we need a little help. Luckily, uh, we've seen the concept that we're going to use already. In oh, yeah, question first. Uh, this is for the class labels. We're looking at the the, yeah, we're looking at, uh, we're interested in what we know about the class labels. So the less uniform the distribution on the class labels is, the more we know, so to speak. Um, so we've seen the, uh, a helpful concept already in the first uh, probability lecture. We looked at entropy, the entropy of a probability distribution, which, if you remember, was the uh, expectation of the code length under the optimal code length for that distribution. So review that lecture if you have no idea what that means. But for now, we'll just, stick, well, we'll just say, well, this is a formula called the entropy, which we can compute. Uh, it gives us a value in bits, which is the expected, which, is, which tells us if we use an optimal code to encode a sample from this distribution, what's the expected value in the number of bits we will use. And what we see is that if this is a uniform distribution, uh, the entropy is maximal. So for any distribution on four elements, we get a maximal entropy if the probability for all four elements is the same. And the more non-uniform it is, the more we know about the distribution, the more we know about what we're going to see if we sample from the distribution, the less bits we need to encode that, the more we can be smart about our encoding and use fewer bits. Uh, so the lower the entropy becomes. And if we have a, uh, as we saw then in that lecture, if the probability is one for, the, for one of the outcomes and zero for the others, then we don't need to encode anything because we already know the outcome and the entropy becomes zero. So, summarize, entropy is a good value to measure uh, uniformity of distributions. So we can, uh, that gives us one piece of puzzle, we can use entropy, compute entropy, to uh, determine how uneven a class distribution is, and we're looking for things with low entropy. So here, 
this is a good split because in particular the uh, distribution on the S uh, leaf has a low entropy. Uh, but we have four distributions here, three output distributions after the split, and one input distribution going in before the split, which we need to combine somehow into a single value that gives us the uh, tells us how good this split is. So we need to uh, combine these the entropies of these four distributions. We'll need some extra uh, concepts from information theory for that. So first we'll define the conditional entropy. Uh, so here on top we have a conditional distribution of the outcome based on the one of the features, the feature that we're considering. So it's the distribution on the class label on one of the features. And we can compute the entropy of this uh, value given that the feature has a particular value. So given that we uh, see a movie with genre drama, we can compute the entropy of the output. So that's basically the entropy of this distribution here, which looks like this. This is not conditional entropy yet. This is just the entropy of a probability distribution which happens to be conditioned on one, uh, one value for G. This is just that formula for entropy that we saw earlier, but now the probabilities are POD. Uh, and we have three of these distributions, so we have three entropy values, because we have three distributions here at the bottom. So we can compute this, these three. Um, and the way the, that conditional entropy combines them is by taking the expectation over the value of G, because some values of G are more likely, some values are less likely. So if we take the expectation over the value of G, of this particular value, this uh, HO given G, then we get the conditional entropy. So the conditional entropy is the expected entropy uh, on O given the value of G, with the expectation taken over the distribution on G. So that looks like this, if you fill in the definition of expectation. So that's the conditional entropy, which allows us to define the information gain, because remember we have one distribution left that we haven't used, which is how much, we, how much information we had before we went into the split, this one at the top here, we haven't used that yet. And the information gain is basically the difference uh, of what we, how much we know before we go into the split uh, to how much we know after we go into the split, and we want to maximize that. So that looks like this. The information gain of uh, splitting on G, given O, given the, the output distribution going in, uh, is the output distribution, the entropy of that output distribution before we split, minus the, out the entropy of the, output dis of the expected output distribution after we split. So we know we're going to split on G, but we don't know what the value of G is going to be. So we take an expectation there. Uh, so the information gain is the expectation of how much information we will gain if we split averaged over all uh, possible uh, movies we can see. So it basically looks like this, if this is our, um, our split. We call the set at the top S, so this is this data set of all instances going into this split. In this case, since we're at the root, it's the data set of all instances. Uh, and at the bottom, we uh, this split basically partitions that data set into three subsets, SR, SD, and SS, which uh, have these class distributions. So then the information gain is the entropy of S, the set going in, minus, all these, uh, minus the entropies of all these guys, weighted by their relative uh, proportions. So this... Uh, yeah, this is fairly easy to compute given the data, which you will uh, practice a little bit in the uh, next week's homework session. Uh, but this is basically the information gain. That's basically the value you split on. So for all potential splits, you compute the information gain, and you pick the one that has the highest information gain. So practically, this is the algorithm. You start with a single unlabeled leaf, 
which is like an empty tree. You loop until there are no unlabeled leaves. And then for each unlabeled leaf, with a segment, so each leaf corresponds to a segment, to a subset of the data. Uh, if you've hit the stop condition, you just label with the majority class of the segment, the class that occurs most in, those, uh, in that subset of the data. If you haven't hit the stop condition yet, you look at all possible features that still remain, and you split, on the f uh, you split the leaf on the feature with the highest information gain. And you keep doing that until there are no leaves left. So that is all there is to say about decision trees, so trees used for classification. Uh, oh, no, sorry. One more thing. I always cross this one out too early uh, because we haven't seen numeric features yet. We've only done categorical features. Uh, so if we have numeric features, for instance, uh, the length of the movie in seconds. Uh, usually what we do is do uh, we do a binary split. So we split in only two leaves. And we choose a threshold. So everything above the threshold goes in one direction. Everything below the threshold goes in another direction. Um, and then we just want to choose the threshold that maximizes the uh, information gain. Uh, let me see if I have a slide on that, actually. Oh, yeah, so the simplest way to do that is just to look at all um, values that are in between two class boundaries. So here there's one value in between an O and a W. That's a potential threshold to split on. So you look at all of those potential thresholds, you compute the information gain for all of them, and you pick the one that gives you the highest information gain, which might be this one. And that gives you a, a split on a numeric feature, which is what we saw also in the first lecture. Looks like this. And uh, I also showed you in the first lecture what it looks like if you actually do this with SK, SK Learn on this data set, and you get this very complicated looking uh, decision boundary. So you might say, if I'm not allowed to split, if I only have two features, how can I get this complicated a decision boundary? Because remember, as I said, with numeric features, it does make sense to split twice on the same feature because you can split on a different threshold next time. Every time you hit the same feature, you can split on, on a different threshold. Uh, so with numeric features, you can keep splitting until you uh, uh, you can keep splitting lots and lots of times. It doesn't matter if you uh, run out of features to use, which also leads to a lot of overfitting. As we saw this in the main in the first lecture, I use this mainly as an example of an overfitting classifier. So that's the next thing we have to deal with. Here's an illustration of how to detect overfitting. So uh, at the top, we see the training error, which goes up, uh, training uh, accuracy, which goes up and up and up and up towards one as a function of the size of the tree. So the more nodes we add, the better the training error is. But at some point, we see quite quickly that the test error, uh, the test accuracy, sorry, begins to decay because we're overfitting. So we're memorizing lots of stuff about the training data, but it doesn't generalize to the test data. So basically, we need to limit the size of the tree in order to combat overfitting. So one thing to do is what we saw earlier to just set a hard cutoff on the ma ma maximum depth of the tree. But another thing we can do is pruning, which is basically we go all the way to the right here to a tree of maximum depth, and then we start backtracking. Then we start cutting away uh, leaves of the tree, or parents of leaves of the tree. So we withhold some data. We train on the rest. We train a maximum depth tree. And then after training, we start looking at everything that is the parent to a leaf, one by one. And we compare the tree with this node to the tree without this node. 
uh, compare their performance on the withheld data. And if it does better without the node, we cut the node out. And we keep doing that until we hit a tree that, uh, where we can cut no more nodes. So that's called pruning, uh, which is helpful against overfitting. So you get this sort of full power of tree potentially at maximum depth. You don't have to decide beforehand what your maximum depth is going to be. And you still have a way of combating overfitting. Um, one thing that's important to say is here that we're basically splitting off a validation data set, which I've called withheld data here, in order to guide our search for a model. In order to tell us basically, um, yeah, to, uh, to, to, to guide our search, we need some withheld data. So when you're doing that in combination with an existing validation data set, you're not allowed to use the data set you've already split off for validation. So if you go through this process that we talked about earlier of splitting a training, validation, and test set, uh, you use your training and validation for hyperparameter selection, but also for selecting which model you're using. So you might be deciding between a neural network and a decision tree and a linear classifier based on this validation data. Then you shouldn't give the decision tree access to this validation data for its search, because then it gets an unfair advantage over the neural network and the linear classifier, who don't get to tune their search based on the validation data. So you need to split again. To control your search, you need another validation data. And this happens in neural networks as well. You have something called early stopping, where you also decide based on, on validation data whether or not to stop searching. Again, separate validation data. So you get lots of splits, and you do end up with uh, not that much training data. OK. So now we're finished with decision trees. And we get to regression trees. So we use the same data set, but now we need a numeric uh, target label. So we go for box office figures. Uh, and the features for the time being will just be uh, categorical. So first question is, how do we label the leaves? Given that we have some tree that splits some way, that segments the instance space, we end up at the leaves of the tree with a bunch of uh, box office figures. Uh, practically, we use either the mean or the median. Uh, and sort of there's some hints in the fourth lecture about how to choose between the mean and the median. Depends on the distribution on this, uh, this value. But basically, we can label the tree with the mean and the median of the instances in that segment. So that's pretty straightforward. Uh, then we have to decide what makes a good split. We, have, we need an, uh, an analog to this information gain. Because on a bunch of numbers, we can't really compute entropy, because they're all different. So we don't sort of have this, uh, this binning thing where we can bin them and use them as a probability distribution. If we go back to the intuition behind the information gain, we wanted to know uh, how much, if we want the, the information, basically, that a particular set has. Uh, basically, the question is, how much does this set tell us? How much information do we have given that set? And what we can say for numeric features is that if the set is very spread out, we don't know a lot. We have a lot of uncertainty. And if all the values in the set are very close to each other, then we know pretty much very well what to what value to, to give to that uh, segment. Uh, so one good way of measuring spread is variance. So if the variance of a particular set is low, then everything's very close together. And we know that the median is basically the median or the mean, whatever we pick, uh, is a good representative of that set, and therefore a good prediction. And if everything's very spread out, and we still have a mean of me or a median, but the true value is very likely to be far away from the mean, so we don't know a lot. So basically, we go for this. We we take this information gain formula, and we replace all the entropies by variances. Uh, but otherwise, the the um, formula stays the same, and that's what we use in regression trees to decide what feature to split off. Otherwise, the algorithm is exactly the same. And if you have a deep tree. If you allow it to overfit, you get something like this. So as we saw earlier, lots and lots of splits. 
uh, lots and lots of splits because we're using numeric features here. So on a numeric feature, uh, the tree can go lots, it can go very deep, and uh, you can get lots and lots of splits. Uh, in two dimensions, so two features might look like this. So it's sort of staircasey because uh, in a particular segment, the uh, the output is always the same. So for a particular region of instance space, the, the value is always the same. So the function is always a staircase function. Uh, yeah, and just to end, a uh, note to end on, uh, tree models, decision trees, and regression trees. are examples of a model with a an internal generalization hierarchy. So if you have this uh, spectrum between models that underfit a lot, that have low bias, uh, sorry, high bias, low variance, and models that overfit a lot, with high variance, low bias, um, some models do one or the other, and some models allow you to straddle that spectrum. And Decision trees are one of those models. So a constant function is basically a tree without splits. A tree with one split only is called a stump. And these are underfitting models with very low capacity. So they, they are likely to have high bias and likely to have low variance. Uh, and then the deeper you go and the more splits you allow, down to the full depth tree, uh, you get more overfitting, which means higher, likely higher vi variance and lower bias. Uh, so one thing you can do to avoid overfitting is to find, by hyperparameter tuning, the exact point in this spectrum below these, uh, between these two, that gives you a good uh, generalization error. Gives you good generalization. But another thing you can do is to train lots and lots of different models and to combine their judgments into one judgment. Uh, and it turns out that can also help you both with high bias and with high variance. Uh, in the case of trees, a combination of many trees is called a forest, so that's called a decision forest or a regression forest. Uh, but in general, you can do this with other models as well. And that's what we'll look at after the break. So I'll take 15 minutes. And then we'll start talking about ensembling methods. All right. So, ensembling. Um, if you remember, in the um, third lecture, I showed you this picture to illustrate the principle of bias and variance, which is to remind you uh, so the, the, the metaphor here is like throwing darts at a dartboard. You have high bias, uh, low variance. If you throw them far away from the center, you're aiming for the center, obviously. Uh, if you throw them far away from the center, but very accurately at the same point, far away from the center, and you have uh, high variance, low bias, if on average you hit the center, but they're all very spread out, both are bad. And if you train, a sing train and test a single model, that's like throwing only one dart. So you don't know for a single model whether you have high bias or high variance. You just know you're far away from the center. Um, and we're going to start uh, with the high variance case, which sort of corresponds to overfitting models, such as these deep trees or... Uh, uh, stuff like that, um, which is also called an unstable learner. It's unstable because the next time you train the model, with a slight difference, slight difference in training data, slight difference in initialization, you might get a very different result. And among all those very different results might be one that gives you great generalization uh, uh, accuracy, but um, practically you don't know that. So the takeaway here, or the, the, the thing that this tells us, is that if we have an unstable learner, and we could repeat the process a bunch of times, 
we could actually average out their recommendations, their outputs, to get a, a low variance, to get rid of this variance. And if we get rid of this variance, we don't have any bias, so we get a good, accurate dart. If we get to throw multiple darts and average their scores. The problem is, for that, we need different data sets. Every dart requires a new data set. And we have usually only one data set, because data is expensive. So the question is, can we cheat? Can we somehow get a bunch of darts from one data set? And we already saw something in the uh, third lecture called bootstrapping, which is sort of simulating the process of sampling another data set by sampling from your original data set. The bootstrapping worked basically by um, sampling with replacement from your original data set. So if your original data set has 10,000 examples, you sample a new data set of 10,000 examples, but with replacement. So some data sets will end up in your new data set twice. Some instances will end up in your new data set twice. Uh, on average, about 63% will be uh, unique or uh, of the original data set will be included in the new data set, the rest will be duplicated. But that means that your new data set is slightly different from your old data set, but still follows broadly the same distribution, with the exception that it now has duplicate instances. And in uh, lecture three, we saw that, uh, we looked at that as a way of sort of figuring out what your variance actually is, figuring out the spread in your accuracy. Uh, but we can actually use that as a way of training different models, a way of getting different darts in the board. So before we look at how to do that, uh, let's look at what this bootstrapping actually, what we're actually sampling from, because we can be a little bit more precise in what this actually gives us, uh, which is uh, a sample from the what's called the empirical distribution, which we'll look at uh, in detail now. So first we need to define the cumulative density, which is just a standard way of looking at a distribution, a probability distribution. Uh, so here at the top we have the probability density function of a normal distribution, which we've, uh, we all know and love. And then at the bottom I've plotted the cumulative density, which is basically the probability mass below a certain point. So at the top is a probability density, at the bottom is a probability because we're looking at intervals, so we see how much probability mass is below this point x here, and we plot that as a value between 0 and 1, which is this sort of sigmoid curve. And at the left, we're very close to 0, because almost nothing, no probability mass is below 0, and at the right, we're almost at 1, because almost all probability mass is below 1. So that's called the cumulative density function, and especially when you're talking about sampling, it's often very helpful to look at cumulative density function. So let's see what happens when we resample our data. So we have we start with at the top a probability distribution that our data is sampled from. We have a small data set, five instances with one feature, sampled from this uh, this uh, probability distribution. So what happens if we now, instead of sampling from the blue curve, we sample one of these five points? That's points. That's another probability uh, distribution for which we can plot the cumulative density. So if we're at the left, there's a probability of zero of getting lower than minus two, because none of these points are lower than minus two. As we move to the right, one of the points is lower than here, which is about minus 1.6. So there's a probability of one in five that we sample that point if we sample from the data set, it's a probability of 2 in 5 that we sample one of the lowest two points, and so on down to uh, up to 1. So we get a staircase function that broadly goes from 0 to 1. So that's the cumulative density function of sampling, from our, sampling a single point from our data set, like we're doing when we're bootstrapping. If we have more points, we still get this staircase function, but it follows the curve of the uh, density function of our, of our uh, sorry, follows the cumulative density of our original probability distribution more accurately. And then if we sample even more points, 500 in this case, then it's almost indistinguishable. 
So all of this is just to say that if we have lots of data and we sample from the, uh, we uh, resample the data, so we sample from the empirical distribution, which is a staircase function, in the limit of having lots and lots of data, this converges to our data distribution. Uh, the question is, what does this tell us? What can we do with this? So this tells us that if we take a, uh, a bunch of samples from our data, so we resample our data, what we're approximating is a sample from the data distribution, which we can't do, which is too expensive. Gathering another data set, that's too expensive. So instead, we to, to have, as a cheap alternative, we're resampling our data. But this tells us that if we have enough data, Resampling our data is a good approximation of sampling from the original data distribution. Yeah, because you're you're close to this uh, this uh, in in this case a sigmoid function for different distributions might look different, but you you get uh, you approximate this uh, cumulative density function of your uh, your data distribution. So that's why resampling bootstrapping is is justified as a way of approximating a sample from your data distribution. So now we can use that and train different models that uh, are good approximations of models that are trained on our samples from our data distribution. And the first way we'll do that is uh, bagging, which is uh, short for bootstrap aggregating, which is basically just the simplest, most straightforward way of doing this. We resample a bunch of data sets, k. We train a model on each of them. This collection of models we call our ensemble. And we just ask all of the models, what do you think? What's your, uh, what class should we assign this particular instance? And uh, we just take a majority vote, usually. So we get a bunch of replies from all of these models in our ensemble. And we take a majority vote, and that's our output class. Or if we want a probabilistic classifier, we can take the uh, relative frequencies. But for uh, simple cases, we just... Uh, take a majority vote. So if we have a data set like this, and we train a, a bunch of linear classifiers by bagging, our ensemble might look like this. So these might be all our decision tree, uh, decision um, boundaries, all of them linear, because we're all training a bunch of linear classifiers. And what you see is if you do uh, a majority vote among these, so let's say all of them above the line is red, below the line is blue. Then the decision boundary of the ensemble looks like this. So this is where, this is the line for which the majority of the classifiers above the line says red and below the line says blue. Which means that, which shows you that the ensemble uh, has, more uh, has more power in some sense than the uh, individual members of the ensemble. The individual members can only produce lines, and the ensemble actually manages to produce a piecewise linear decision boundary. Uh, how does it decide to pick which line on which point? So it's by, um, by majority vote. So at this point, this line segment here uh, uh, at the top, the this one wins because at this point, more of the classifiers, uh, let me say it properly, this is the line above which more classifiers say red than blue. And this is the line below which more classifiers say uh, blue than red. But at this uh, corner here, it changes because one of the classifiers drops more steeply than the other, so then the proportions change. No, it, it, it doesn't check, it doesn't draw this line, it just, uh, for every given point in this space, it just looks at the ensemble, asks all of them to classify, uh, looks at which has the majority, and this is the decision boundary that emerges from that, uh, from that behavior, basically. Yeah, everything gets, so every point in this space gets classified by, by all K classifiers, uh, and this is just the picture that emerges. 
so this, uh, if you do this with deci uh, decision trees, you get what's called a random forest. So basically, you sub subsample the data in the way we've already uh, discussed. You also usually subsample the features. So for each uh, model in your ensemble, you look at only a subset of the features. And then you train small decision trees. Or a, a full decision tree, it doesn't really matter, but you train a bunch of decision trees on those subsamples of the data, and you ensemble them. Which is a very nice, straightforward way to get a classifier that works well. So random forests are a very good first, uh, first attempt in any data science project. And that helps you to reduce, bagging in general helps you to reduce the variance. So this is multiple darts at the dartboard, a lot of, lot of variance, you can reduce the variance in this way. So then a natural question. is what about the other case? What if we have high bias? So we have a kind of underpowered model, an underfitting model. Uh, can we still use ensembling in this setting to get all of these darts down? So that's a less intuitive way of thinking about it, and this was kind of an open question for a long time, called the... Uh, Hypothesis boosting question, so can you take a weak hypothesis, so a weak model, like a linear model, uh, that usually that's sort of underpowered to represent your data, can you train lots of those as well, and then boost their representational power, boost their capacity uh, more towards this sort of overfitting regime, but not too far. Which led to a method, uh, well, uh, to an answer, yes, you can do this, and that's why the method is called boosting. It boosts the power of your hypothesis class. And the first thing we need to talk about is uh, a weighted data set. The first thing you need in order to do boosting is you basically add a column to your data set, which you'll call W here, and at the start all uh, instances in your data set have the same weight, W, uh, 1, and then as we boost, we are going to change these weights to make some instances more important and more relevant, and some instances less important. So you can, uh, in some cases, they sum to 1, all the weights, and in some cases, you just don't normalize them. But the higher the weight, the more, I the more we care about getting that instance right. And then the general idea of boosting you start with some basic classifier M0, you iterate, so instead of training your, uh, like we did with bagging, training your, ins your models, your model ensemble in parallel, you train them one after the other in series. Uh, so let's do, do this step by step because notation is going to be important. So our ans uh, at every step we train a model called MT, on the data using the current weights. Then we reevaluate the weights and we train a new model. We reevaluate the weights and we train a new model. And our ensemble at, at every step is the sum of the outputs of all the models by a particular weight A. So the basic idea, just to get above this notation for a bit, is you train models in series using uh, how well your last model did, you update the weights, usually to say the examples you previously didn't do very well on, we give a higher weight so that the next model pays more, uh, more attention to the difficult examples. And we train again and we iterate this process. That's how we train our ensemble. So each model is trained on the difficult examples from the last training run. And then we figure out some um, model weights A, by which uh, how, how much attention we pay to each model, and then we sum the outputs of all the models. And that's the, um, uh, the, the classification or the, the, the value that our model ensemble gives us, by which we classify. Uh, 
Oh, that's a good question. Is it similar to backtracking? No, it's not backtracking. So you train a model, you keep that model, but then when you train the next model, you uh, reweight the data so that the next model pays attention to slightly different stuff. But then you keep that model fixed, and only for the next model, you reweight the data and pay attention to uh, uh, different uh, examples. And at every step, you sort of look at how your model ensemble so far is doing, and that's how you decide to reweight the data. And then uh, at K, you have a model ensemble with containing K models. So in order to do this, you need to figure out first how to train on weighted data. So if your model has a loss function, it's very easy, because loss function is usually the sum over some error function, in this case, the squared errors. So you just make that a weighted sum. You make sure that your weights are uh, values between 0 and 1, or at least positive values. And then you just weight the loss. And you train, you optimize for the weighted loss. If you don't have an explicit loss function, uh, like with uh, regression trees, for instance, or decision trees, um, you can resample your data, but resample by the weights, so that instances with high weights have more uh, probability of being included. So that's how, given some weights, you train a model. So at every step in your boosting process, you have some weights, you can train a model on those weights. So to make this more precise, we'll look at one specific instance of boosting, which is called ADA boost, which has a sort of more rigorous uh, way of arriving at these uh, sort of the open questions. How exactly do we set the weights and how exactly do we set these A values, the uh, weight for each model in the ensemble sum? Uh, Ada boost gives us a sort of uh, um, principled way of arriving at those, uh, at, at how to set those values. So first we'll set up some notation. So we have a family of weak learners, MT. So learners that by themselves aren't necessarily good, uh, or don't have to be necessarily good. They could be good, but we'll call them weak learners because we expect them to be things like linear classifiers. So uh, relative, so uh, easy to train and relatively uh, uh, poor, uh, poor classification accuracy. Uh, and we'll let them output minus one for negative and one for positive. So it's binary classification. And we'll number the classes minus one and uh, plus one like we did with the support vector machine. Uh, and the target values are also minus one and plus one. Uh, in this case, the target values are yi, so the target value for instance xi is yi. And at any point t in our uh, training our model ensemble, we compute the output of the whole ensemble like this as the uh, sum of all the models we've trained so far, m0 to mt minus 1 weighted by some value at, and we're going to figure out later what that uh, value at should be. Which means that at uh, when we're training a new model, our, so when we're uh, at time step t and we're trying to figure out what uh, model mt should be, we can look at the output for our model ensemble so far. And what we are looking for is this term, some value at and some model mt uh, multiplied by some model mt as applied to x. And at this point, all we need to figure out, we already have mt minus 1, so we already have our model figured out so far. All, at this point, all we need to figure out is at and mt. And we'll do that by minimizing this loss function. Uh, overall, so E I T is the per instance loss, which is what the model, the entire model ensemble outputs, so the model ensemble with our new model included, outputs multiplied by minus I1 uh, exponent, uh, raised to the power of E, which is this function here. So the higher this thing in the exponent is, the uh, uh, higher the error, 
and then we just sum that over all instances. So that's what we're going to try and minimize, this capital ET. So note that that is the error not over the current model that we're currently training, that's the error over the whole, mo whole ensemble with our new model included. So we're choosing our new model, but we're choosing it to optimize capital MT. So we're choosing it to optimize right away the classification performance of the whole ensemble. So that's our per instance loss, which we can do a bit of rewriting on. Uh, so first is MT, capital MT here. We can split that into uh, what our new model tell, what our new model contributes, and what the ensemble so far contributes, which looks like this, because the ensemble so far is fixed. We're no no backtracking allowed. So the this part here, this uh, MT minus one, that's a constant. We can't optimize for that. The only thing we can optimize is AT and MT, uh, lowercase MT. So we can split those up. Uh, split up the sum by taking that out of the exponent. And we'll rename uh, the part that we can't control here, W. So this is just the weight. For instance, I, this, uh, the uh, classification error of the ensemble so far, that's the weight we assign to instance I. Because since we're optimizing this uh, function here, we can't control the thing on the left, the factor on the left. So that's our weight. That's given. And the things we control, AT and MT, are in the factor on the right. So we have now a weighted optimization objective. Over the whole data set, we're just trying to minimize this value here weighted by WI. And the weights are the things we can change. So now we know how to weight the data set. We just weight it by the error of our uh, ensemble so far. So now how do we pick AT and MT? We know the weights now. How do we pick AT and MT to minimize this error value? Uh, first, we can take this sum and split it by the instances we correctly classified and the instances we incorrectly classified in our current, uh, our current model. So we split the sum into, two, into all the terms for the correct classifications and the incorrect classifications, then we can, so for the, uh, then we can uh, get rid of this yi. Um, see, oh yeah, uh, we just take the uh, e to the power of minus at, e to the power of minus, oh yeah, sorry, let me make this more clear. So what happens here, we have uh, an output by our model, our chosen model MT, and an, uh, a target value YI. So if they are correct, one is minus one and the other is also minus one, then those two together become one. When they're incorrect, those two together become minus one. So for the incorrect, so for the correct ones, the YI and the MT cancel out, and we end up just minus with just minus AT. Uh, if they're correct, and if they're incorrect, uh, we get minus one, because one of them is negative and the other is positive. And we also get rid of them, but they cancel out. The mi resulting minus one cancels out against this uh, minus here. So we end up with e to the power of at. So the thing to note here is that the target value yi and the model output have disappeared, because we're separating the sum into the correct and the incorrect values. which allows us to take this e to the power of at out of the sum, and we end up with just a sum over the weights. So we have a sum over the weights of the incorrectly classified samples and a sum over the weights of the correctly classified samples, uh, instances, I should say. So we'll call those, and these are all values we can't control, we can't optimize for, these are given because we're not backtracking. So we'll call this uh, one uh, wi, capital WI, and we'll call this sum capital WC. Uh, and since we're minimizing this, so we're uh, figuring out how to minimize the model, 
since we're minimizing this value, we can multiply by a constant. And uh, so uh, it's not exactly the same, but it's the value uh, a function with the same minimum. So we multiply by e to the power of a t. So this thing here in front disappears, and this becomes uh, twice that. And then this is always a difficult step. Oh yeah, and then if we add w i, uh, if we add plus w i minus w i, we can rewrite that into this. So adding plus w i minus w i doesn't change anything. What we see is that this here on the left, this term on the left, w c plus w i, is a constant. That's just the weight of our whole data set. So our model determines the proportion between the number of, de determines the uh, values of w c and w i. So that's something we control. But the sum of those is always the same. That's always a constant. So this term on the right is just a constant. Uh, this thing here is a constant multiplier. And the only thing that now determines the minimum of this function is wi. So the takeaway here is that in order to minimize this function up top here, to order in order to, mi to choose m to minimize this error, all we need to minimize is the total weight of the incorrectly classified examples. Fourth row, this row? This one. So this thing here disappears, right? Uh, because we are, well, note that this is not an equality. This uh, drew a little arrow here. So we change from this function to this function by multiplying um, multiplying by e to the power of a. We multiply the whole thing by e to the power of a t, uh, which changes the function but doesn't change its minimum because we're minimizing for m t, so a t is just a constant. Uh, also, a good question: Why did y, y t? There's no y t. Y i. Y i. Why does y i disappear? That's a good question. It's an important question. So what we're doing here is we're breaking the sum up into the instances that we correctly classified, and the so we're looking at m, right? How does m classify these instances? Some of them it gets right. Some of them it gets wrong. Um, if it gets them right, then either y i is minus one and the model is minus outputs minus one. So then this thing here becomes minus one times minus one and it disappears. Uh, or they're both one and then it also disappears. So the y i disappears against the empty. And if it gets them wrong, then one of them is minus one, the other one is one. Uh, so this th these two multiplied by each other become minus one and then it disappears again. Uh, it's the same thing, but this minus here disappears. Yes, yeah, the, the, the true value versus the model output cancel out if it gets it right, and otherwise it's a minus one. And then you do all this rewriting. So you end up with the thing that we're minimizing is just wi. So if you didn't quite follow this, and as you can see, I was struggling with it a bit uh, too, so there's a complicated derivation, but the takeaway is that the, to minimize this value, to choose your model to minimize this error term here, you just want to minimize the sum of the incorrectly labeled examples, which is very straightforward. So you just want to maximize your accuracy. You want to uh, minimize your error. You want to minimize as few as possible. Uh, but looking at this, these weights. So you're looking now at the weighted data set, and you want to minimize the sum of the incorrectly uh, labeled examples. Uh, so that's how we choose our model. And exactly how we do that depends on our model class. But we know now that when we train our model, we look at our data and we somehow figure out how to minimize the sum of the incorrectly classified examples. Then given the model, once we've done that, we need to choose AT, which is the weight of this particular model, which sort of 
you know, the better we do, the more highly this uh, model should weigh in our sum, uh, our ensemble sum. Um, so now we choose AT to minimize this value. Uh, WC and WI are now constants because we've chosen our model. They've made some correct classifications, some incorrect classifications. Those are now constants, so now we choose AT, uh, which is just basically uh, differentiation. So we end up with this over AT and this over AT, which um, looks very similar now, the derivative, because this exponent function, uh, nothing happens to it if we take the derivative. And if we set this equal to zero and work it out, you see that this value is the value we need for AT. So now we can fill in these values, AT and MT, and get our ADA boost algorithm. So we start with some classifier M0, which is our first. And then uh, we extend it with one classifier at a time. So at some point, we in this loop, we get a sum of a bunch of classifiers, each weighted with AT, and we have to decide what's going to be our next classifier and what's going to be its weight A. First, we choose the classifier, MT, which exactly how we do this depends on what the classifier is, but somehow we want to tell it to minimize the sum of weights of the incorrect classifications, where the weights WI are defined like this. And then given that model, we choose, we check what the weights of the incorrect classification and the weights of the correct classifications are, WI and WC. We compute this value to be AT, and we add that to our sum, and we continue with the next uh, iteration of the loop. So that's called ADA. Uh, ADA boost, which is just a way of doing this boosting. So even if uh, your classifier is just slightly better than chance, so even if you get a weak classifier that gives you just 51% uh, accuracy, boosting still works. So if you have something like a decision stump, which barely gives you any advantage over just a random classifier, uh, you can still boost it. And if you just boost it enough, because these classifiers are usually very cheap, you can just boost and boost and boost and boost, you still get a very strong classifier. Uh, so we looked at ADA boost, there's uh, also brown boost and logit boost and lots of different variations. Um, and one important thing to see, if you visualize bagging versus boosting, what you see on the, it, I mean, I drew this, uh, uh, this is not based on any data, so this is more or less what it would look like if you did. Uh, on the left you see bagging. Basically you get this, uh, you get, because you're training in parallel, you don't get a lot of variation in the uh, resulting uh, classifications, in the resulting classifiers. You basically, especially if you, lot, if you have lots of data, you basically get the same classifier every time. And it helps to reduce the variance a little bit, but especially if you don't have a high variance classifier, that doesn't change much. So actually the, the average output of this classifier is not that different from uh, the output of a single classifier. Whereas if you look at boosting, because, every, because they're trained in series and every new classifier is based on the mistakes of the old classifiers, uh, you get a lot, a lot more variation within your ensemble and therefore uh, something like this, a lot more variation in, in the resulting decision boundary. So that's ADA boost. Uh, second boosting uh, method I wanted to look at is gradient boosting. Like I said, also very popular, uh, which is for regression models. So ADA boost, ADA boost is more for classification models. Gradient boosting is more for regression models. Uh, and again, we'll start with the intuition before we look into the more technical details. So the main intuition is, again, you do this in series. You, you train your ensembles in series, one after the other. And at every step, a little bit like ADA boost, you look at the mistakes of the ensemble so far, and 
you train your uh, next model based on those. And in the case of gradient boosting, we fit, we try to predict, instead of trying to predict the true class, we try and predict the residuals of the ensemble so far. So if we start with a constant model, we do this on a one-dimensional data set, so we have some feature X and some output Y, and these purple points are our data sets. We start with M0, a constant model, it just predicts a constant value, probably the mean, looking at this picture. Then we get some residuals, how wrong the model was. So these blue, uh, sorry, yellow lines are the residuals of our model, and they tell us how wrong the model was. And then the next model in our series, M1, predicts those residuals. So on the left is our model zero, and here we have, oh yeah, sorry, we optimize model one not to predict the residuals, but we optimize, yes, uh, no, I said it right. So we optimize model one to predict the residuals, so that model zero plus model one becomes a good uh, predictor of the true value, which makes intuitive sense, at least, uh, I hope. And then we do the same thing again, so we get some, we look at the residuals of model one plus model, uh, model zero plus model one. We get some new residuals, we try and predict those by model two, and we add that model to our ensemble. We get a slightly more complicated line. And so on, and so on. So here's the algorithm. We start with an initial model, M0, which is usually a constant model, just a model that always outputs a constant value. We train to some fixed size of ensemble K. Uh, we compute the residuals for our model so far. We call those Ri, which gives us a new data set with the same features, but with a new target column Ri for every instance. We fit a model to that new data set, and we add that model to our ensemble. And we add it again with a weight, in this case, uh, gamma yt. Um, and here we usually f optimize that weight separately. So with AT in the ADA boost, we could find a nice analytical solution for AT. It's not, I don't think there, there is an analytical solution here. So we optimize it by line search or we slowly decay it. That also works. Um, in practice, we just figure out some good way to, uh, to set gamma T. So what you see is that your uh, model after three steps is your uh, model two plus the new, uh, so your ensemble so far, plus the new models weighted by this gamma. And if you expand this M2, it was trained in the same way. So M2 is M1 plus the uh, gammas of the, uh, uh, plus the, the gamma, uh, and then you sort of telescope this sum out to give you the whole sum of the ensemble. So that's gradient boosting, that's the whole algorithm. So that's fairly straightforward. So you might ask, why is it called gradient boosting? Because so far we haven't actually taken any gradients or uh, done anything with gradients. Um, and to see why it's, uh, where the gradients come in, it helps to imagine a model that has a single output for each instance. So basically a terrible model. Basically we store whatever, if we have 100,000 instances, we store 100,000 values that we're going to output for that instance, for every instance. So that's a perfectly overfitting model that doesn't generalize at all. Let's go, if we call that wi, and if we take the squared error for that, uh, for that model for a particular instance, we compute the derivative with respect to its weight, we see that uh, the gradient of the squared error with respect to this model output is wi minus, uh, is, uh, wi minus yi. Or in other words, if, we, if you think back to this gra uh, backpropagation algorithm where we computed local gradients, if you take the gradient of the model output, uh, sorry, the gradient of this error with respect to the model output, then this local gradient just gives you this value, the output minus the, uh, the true value, which is this residual that we're trying to predict. 
So essentially what you're saying here is if you can train your model by gradient descent, if you cannot train your model by gradient descent, you can compute this value. And this value gives you sort of in model output space the direction, the gradient that you want to follow. So even uh, if you cannot train your model by gradient descent, like in the case of these regression trees, for instance, that they usually cannot be simply trained by gradient descent, in your output space, this is the gradient that you want to follow. So your new model, if you build lots and lots of models, uh, or sort of, let's say, if you start with some model and you're taking a step in model space, you want to figure out which direction to go in model space, this is your direction you want to go, or in the, the, the output space, I should say. Uh, so even if you can train it by gradient descent, you can still tell your model, try and go more in that direction. However your model is trained, try and follow this direction, which in this case, if you have a squared error loss, corresponds to trying to fit, trying to predict the residuals and adding that to your model. So one addition to this uh, gradient boosting sum is like a step along a gradient. And this insight, aside from telling us where the name came from, also allows us to train two different loss functions. So here we're optimizing the squared error loss, but actually if we don't want to optimize the squared error loss, for instance, if we want to, uh, yeah, so if we optimize the squared error loss, we end up with this uh, target. We want to predict the residuals. But if we have a different loss function, uh, we can work out what we're supposed to predict then to do gradient boosting on this loss function. For instance, if we have not the squared error but the absolute error loss, then we can work out the derivative of the absolute error over the model output, which if we chain rule it, we've seen this before in the third lecture, uh, works out as the sign. So if we instead of predicting the residuals, we predict the sign of the error. So instead of predicting the residuals, how big the error is, we predict just whether the model, um, the previous model predicted too high or too low. And then we can do gradient boosting with that. Uh, we're basically minimizing this loss function instead of the squared error loss, which as we saw, sometimes this is a better loss function. So this uh, gradient perspective on our boosting method allows us to uh, fit the method to different loss functions than uh, uh, a squared error loss. So that's gradient boosting. So we saw, uh, and boosting in general. So we saw gradient boosting for regression and ADA boost for classification. Here's a little summary, I'll skip that. Uh, finally, stacking to rush this very quickly, but it's not a very complicated me method. Basically what you do in stacking is if you have a bunch of different models, we don't, in this case, we don't care where they came from, but they give you different uh, classifications in this case. What we can do is just take these things that the models told us and add them to our data set. So we just take the predictions of all these other models, we add them to our data set, and then we train a new model. So this new model can now learn that, uh, for instance, for old people, model one is usually very accurate. So if it's old people, then I'm going to follow model one. But if it's young people, then model two is very accurate. So if it's young people, I'm going to follow model two. And if it's uh, a particular height, then all of the models are crap. So I'm going to just follow my own uh, model. So basically, this is a very simple and straightforward model uh, way to get beyond this idea of ADA boost or, or bagging where you just take majority votes or averages, you can actually learn how the model outputs relate to the features. So that's called stacking. And if you do stacking with a neural network, then this combiner, the second model that you train on the outputs of the other models, um, if all of them are neural networks, then the whole thing is just actually a neural network end to end. So you can just train the whole thing end to end as well. Uh, or refine the whole thing end to end. So that's called stacking. Basically, you're going a little bit beyond this idea of just averaging or uh, taking majority votes. 
So this is a summary for today, ensembling, basically, in one word, it's training a bunch of models and somehow combining their outputs. Uh, and that's all I had for you today. Thank you for your attention, and I'll see you on Monday when we talk about matrix models. <laughs>